focus, I'm Elizabeth Doherty. I'm the director of Holy H2O. And um, uh, Eddie Dunbar is here. He's the head of uh, Insect Sciences Museum of California. And this is our first event together. Actually, it's not our first event together. Insect Sciences Museum has been really great at supporting all the work that's being done at Point Milati to keep that place from being developed. And um, they have helped a lot with getting uh, the uh, insect list going for that area. So um, I'm just gonna say again, we're recording. If you don't wanna be recorded, please have your uh, camera turned off. Also, it would be great if you would all right now mute yourselves and then that way um, it won't suddenly switch to your camera when the you know when your doorbell rings or your dog starts barking like mine just <laughs> did um, so that's that um, and I just want to say that one of the reasons that Holy H2O is involved in this is because we're really interested in getting people to know the species living in their watersheds. And so we think about this watershed by watershed, but right now we're talking about all of California native bees. But it's kind of cool that uh, a guy named Dan Rademacher just posted a bee on a flower in Marin that looks just like a bee on the same flower in my yard in Oakland. So I'm super interested to see what Emil does with that. Is it the same bee using the same flower? I don't know. Um, I need this class more than anybody. So I'm the one that organized it. And um, let me just- uh, Elizabeth, see. I'm going to post in the uh, chat, the link to the album where people can post their- Great. Photos. Yeah, if, if you, um, I sent a letter out to everybody who registered uh, to that they would get this link so that you could add pictures that you wanted identified. And um, Eddie's gonna add it to the link right now. Okay, so we can get right to the stuff. Let's, uh, I'm gonna introduce Emil, who's just wonderful. He's the per, anything I know about bees, I know about bees through Emil. There's 1600 different native <laughs> bees in California. It's crazy. And until he stood next to me and said, see that little thing right there? That's a bee. I, you know, it's like, what? That was only two years ago. So I'm on a curve like this. Um, He's been a professional photographer for many years. His bee photos and insect photos are phenomenal. And you can find him on Twitter, uh, where I follow him, at SFBabies. You can all just look up, also look up Hella Bee Nerd, and you'll find him on Twitter. That's and he cute. posts a lot in Insect Sciences Museum of California. And, uh, and following him, on Twitter, you can find a lot of other bee people, which is now how I learn a lot about bees on Twitter, believe it or not. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Emil. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Good morning. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about bees. It's gonna be great. Um, Please bear with me. I normally, when I talk about bees, uh, it's in person, which is really the best way to do it. It's uh, you know going on a bio blitz or something and, and pointing uh, pointing bees out, like Elizabeth was saying. Um, but I do have a presentation for you, and uh, we'll try to. Uh, oh, I see a question. Christina was uh, was asking a question, but um, I'll mention that. So. Um, yeah, let's let's fire up the show. Oops, sorry about that. I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. Can you all see the, the slideshow, Elizabeth? All right. Yes, we sure can. Okay, uh, so let's let's talk about bees and uh, the environment a little bit. So here is a lovely map from the University of Vermont um, showing wild bee abundance across the U.S. And uh, you can see the dark blue, purple blue. <laughs> the darker parts is a, is a higher abundance, and the uh, 
the yellow part is lower. And so you can see that um, there's, well, first of all, there's, so there's about 20,000 bee species uh, worldwide. And I say about because that's how many named and described species there are. But new bees get discovered every year or, or uh, finally named. So, uh, you know, um, actual scientists um, estimate that there's probably, there, there could be up to another, um, there's basically thousands more <laughs> is, is, is likely. Uh, so of those 20,000, um, 4,000, about 4,000 are in the US and 1,600 plus in California. And um, California is actually the number one place area in the world in bee abundance for kind of for its size. So for example, in Brazil, there's 1,800 plus um, species of bees, but Brazil is huge. <laughs> it's a lot bigger than California. So we really have a, a great diversity of bees. Um, so this, this abundance map is interesting because it tells us a little something about um, what bees prefer in their, in their environment. So if you look at Florida, there's not a lot, of, um, a lot of bees. And the reason for that, and then there's a lot in the, in the Southwest where it's, and that's because uh, bees like it warm and dry. The reason um, they like it dry is because um, about 70%, again, 70% plus of native bees um, nest in the ground, right? So um, if you nest in the ground in a tropical wet areas, there's mold, there's bacteria. Um, they're not big fans of that. So, and then of course you'll see there's, um, actually I'm gonna switch to a laser pointer, just like a, there we go. Hopefully you can see that kind of. Anyway, you can see that, of course, where it's colder, um, there's not as, as many bees. You know, native bees um, become active. The, the official number is about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. But really, when I go out and observe bees, it has to be at least 62, which I think is it's kind of about the way it is today outside. So it needs to be at least 62 degrees for them to really. I'm sorry, at least 53 officially, but really about 62 for them to start going about. Uh, you know, like all other insects, bees are cold blooded and they need sun to warm up. Um, so the, the exception, there's, there's, of course, there's always some bees that don't follow the rules. Um, so bumblebees, for example, can generate their own heat. So bumblebees can um, vibrate their secondary flight muscles and, um, warm themselves and so they can fly a lot colder. Um, all right, well, I've spent a long time on this one slide, so let's keep going. All right, so um, this is, <laughs> so why this slide? So I was mentioning in, the, in that title slide that everything is connected. So when we talk about bees, usually you hear that 30% um, of all the food you eat has been pollinated by bees. And if they're gone, you're gonna really miss your avocados and blueberries and, uh, and whatnot. Um, so we usually talk about that, that human benefit connection. Um, but also, um, you know, birds, 89% of birds um, eat insects, of which of course, pollinators like bees are a huge uh, chunk of. So, um, you know, if bees vanish, there's a whole, um, side effect felt, felt all the way down the food chain or up the food chain, I suppose, <laughs> is, the, is the right way to put it. Um, and this is, these are um, European um, bee eaters in France and the male is um, flinging a bee about around, impressing this female he's about to share it with. <laughs> all right, so uh, bee evolution. Um, so about um, so again, research keeps changing. Um, recently, it was believed that it was 125 million years ago that the first bees evolved from wasps. So, um, but recently, so about, I think it was about five years ago, maybe more recently, a, a new fossil was found. And it turns out it was more like 135 million years ago. So basically 135 million years ago, 
um, predatory wasps, crabronid wasps. I'm gonna apologize right now for mutilating Latin and Greek throughout this uh, show. Um, crabronid wasps had a, had a really bright idea and that was um, feeding pollen. Um, so flowers with pollen had just, just evolved as well. And so these wasps figured out that uh, collecting pollen and feeding it to their larvae uh, was a protein rich diet that didn't involve hunting. <laughs> so it was a lot easier, uh, pretty, pretty handy. So the first, uh, the first, those first flowers were sort of big disc shaped flowers with a big pollen ball in the middle, um, sort of like magnolias. And basically um, from that point when the first bees diverged from wasps, uh, the, the flowers and bees, um, I apologize for forgetting a technical term. I'm gonna say co-evolved, that's not quite right. But basically flower diversity increased, bee diversity increased. Um, and this is a really complicated diagram. Uh, you don't have to write it down or memorize it. Uh, you can see it in the recording and we'll of course send you a, a download to this, to this um, presentation. But um, basically, as flowers evolved in different forms and shapes, bees evolved to match them. So flowers evolved different mechanisms for attracting bees to pollinate them and different flower shapes and bees accordingly, um, you know, uh, evolved to different, different forms to be able to take advantage of those flowers. And by about 60 million years ago, there was basically a, a significant diversity of flowers and bees. All right, and we're gonna look at uh, a couple of fossils. So uh, this is a bee from uh, 42 million years ago. And well, if, if you know bees, you can recognize some, some definite bee-like features. Um, you see those antenna um, sort of in the middle side of the head. You can see this, this abdomen actually looks like a hylaeus bee um, that those plates, uh, if you're familiar with those, but anyway. Um, so another one. So this is uh, another bee fossil. And again, if you're familiar with some of our, our California bees, you can see this, this actually uh, resembles a, a sweat bee, <laughs> sweat bee, not bee, sweat bee. Lassio glossum quite closely. It's got that, it got that green. Anyway, uh, moving on. There's some um, helictine bees. All right. So I'm going to show you some uh, alarming charts. <laughs> you don't have to memorize everything that's on them. Um, there will be a download, but it's really quite. Pretty, pretty complicated uh, bee, bee anatomy. And so, but you know, you can, if you have these handy, it's good when you're looking at things like um, bee, like proper bee anatomy keys online, they'll mention. Emil, will these be good in the field or just in the lab? It, it depends. Um, so let's, let's have a look at some of them. So this is a uh, Coleoxyx bee and I'll talk about those later. There's, there's more slides about them. Um, but I think the most relevant well <laughs> um, ironically it doesn't actually uh, mention the uh, tarsal um, segments on, on the captions um, anyway let's let's keep going this is um, an osmia bee which is a, a, a mega chile um, Mason B and oh. so you can come back to these later and I'll talk about them a little bit. Um, one thing you'll, you'll definitely um, see a lot in references uh, for recognizing bees is talking about wing venation and that's um, basically the patterns on their wings. So if you've, of course, if you've captured a bee and, and pinned it and you're looking at it under a microscope, it's pretty easy to, uh, to see that. If you're, um, if you're taking a photo, 
it has to be a clear photo from just the right angle to, to recognize that be um, that wing venation. And it's easier with some um, species than others. I won't talk about it a lot, but I'll, I'll talk about some that are more easily recognizable than others as sort of being um, different from all the other bees. Uh, there's some various, various features on the head. All right, so bees, uh, bees versus wasps. I, I was gonna have a whole section on this. There were a lot of slides and I'd like to release you eventually. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a bee, incidentally, if, if you're not super familiar with native bees. This is a Hylaeus bee. They're one of my favorites because they're tiny and they don't look like bees. Uh, <laughs> and we'll come back to them later. Um, but I, I use this particular photo and I'll talk about what she's doing too in another slide. Um, but I'm talking about this, I, I, uh, I use this particular um, slide for this because this feature uh, called the pronotal lobe is very, uh, very easy to see in this photo. And so that the really the one guaranteed technical difference um, between wasps and bees is branching hairs. So a bee can have hardly any hairs on it like this Hylaeus, um, but the, even the small number of hairs she has are branched. So there's kind of basically twice as many hairs as there would be on a wasp. And the reason for that is that even though they don't use them for carrying pollen in this case, um, they're, they're still evolved for that. So these tiny hairs you see around this, this little sort of shoulder, shoulder um, part of the anatomy will be branched if you can have a close enough look. So if you have a, you know, an actual tiny specimen and you're staring at it and you're trying to figure this out. This is the one spot where they're guaranteed to have hair, no matter how hairless. So if it's a wasp or even the most hairless bee, there will be hairs around this uh, pronotal lobe and you can sort of stare at them very closely and figure out if they're branched or if they're single hairs. I know it's, it's really difficult to tell. <laughs> um, also phylo phylogenetically speaking, which is, um, you know, anatomically speaking, hardcore taxonomists um, don't even consider bees a separate thing from wasps. They're just vegetarian wasps, which is um, kind of funny because there are in fact meat eating bees, which we'll mention later on, not in California, but they're out there. And also um, all adult wasps are in fact vegetarian. So um, wasps really only drink adult wasps drink nectar to power themselves. You see them chewing on meat or an insect, they're just taking that back into their larvae. So it's kind of a, a fuzzy line between the two anyway. Ah, all right, here's the fun bees versus wasps slide. Uh, so in the background there, we have a, one of our local Bombus Vostosensky um, you know, I actually thought this was a queen when I took the picture, but I can see now it's a male and I'll get, get back to that later on. Uh, nonetheless, being a male, he's actually smaller than a queen. And yet this tiny little wasp in the foreground, um, you can see she's a infinitesimally tiny fraction um, of, of him, as it turns out. So there's really, it's kind of crazy just how, how tiny wasps do get smaller than bees. Uh, the, the smaller bee, smallest bee, um, which we do have in California, just sadly not here where I can reach them, are Perdita bees and they're about three millimeters long or smaller. Um, this wasp is probably even smaller than that. And Neil, how do you know that's a wasp and not a bee? That is a quality question. Um, well, we don't have bees this small, so that was helpful. Um, Actually, can I zoom? I cannot zoom. Um, but I know from experience, but one uh, giveaway here uh, that you can see is the fact that the antenna are touching right in the middle of the head, right? Um, you don't really get that with bees in that particular shape. Um, the head shape is, but just in this case, I just know from local experience and because Perdita bees, which would be almost as small are a bit different and I have a pretty to be slide that'll that'll show you why. Emil, is this is this in a PowerPoint? Yes, it is a PowerPoint. If it's, 
if it's PowerPoint, you can hold down the control button and all, if you have a scroller on top of your mouse, push it away from yeah, you and that I will think, zoom in. Uh, I think the problem is that the zoom is stopping me from doing anything other than, than advancing this, uh, going back and forth on the slides. Uh, so oh, I don't I see, okay. have the other controls. <laughs> so a little, little thing. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, so apparently, uh, I will now talk about the one guaranteed uh, way to tell a male from a female bee. So um, there's, you know, with specific species of bees, the, the sexual di dimorphism between males and, and females um, is, there, there's specific ways to tell, but sometimes the bees are near identical. So uh, for example, there's certain longhorn bees where you really can't, can't, just blatantly tell by looking at like longer antenna or different colors or anything like that. Uh, in that case, if you have a close enough look, um, you can know that all male bees have 13 antenna segments and all female bees have 12. There's, there's no exceptions. Um, so if you have, a, a, again, either a specimen or a sharp enough photo where you can count, you can count. So this, I, Pick this one because you can, you can tell. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 segments. Uh, this one also actually has, this particular species has really blatant dimorphism and I'll, I'll have another slide of them later. But um, in case that wasn't a way to tell, you could count the ante antenna segments. So you can always uh, in a pinch count antenna segments to tell males and females apart. Of course, in again, the nice thing about um, looking at bees live is you can usually tell from behavior um, males from females a lot, a lot easier than, than counting antenna bits. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about some, some bee problems. You probably hear a lot about things like um, colony collapse, which is of course about honeybees. Really when, when we hear about, about bee problems, I mean, honeybees because it's commercially important. And so it's something that, you know, understandably corporations and farms like to talk about. Um, what is the, really the big elephant in the room? Is, is part of this slide covered? I don't know, but it's migra migratory beekeeping is, is really a huge, big issue with, with troubles honeybees are having. Um, basically what that is, is um, migratory beekeepers have these large aggregation of hives that they literally keep on semis and they just um, migrate from state to state depending on what's, uh, what fruit is in season in that particular season, right? So, um, and then, so they'll, you know, for almonds being the big one in California, for example. So you'll see a lot of these um, thousands and thousands of, bee, of honeybee hives put together in one place, um, which stresses the bees that this isn't really a good good way to, to live for them. And also it spreads diseases lightning fast uh, and, and parasites like varroa mites. And I'm not criticizing this um, for, for fun. Um, you know, selling honey isn't really that profitable because honey imports from more laxly regulated countries that have a lot of sugar water in them are cheaper. And so beekeepers rarely actually make money big industrial beekeepers don't really make hun uh, money from honey. <laughs> um, they really only make money doing this migratory beekeeping. Um, part of the reason for that is this sort of mistaken impression that we couldn't get native bees to pollinate everything if we really exerted ourselves. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so like I was saying, uh, honeybees, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I know they're not native, but they're, they're around, they're everywhere. <laughs> so, so we can uh, talk a little bit about them. There, uh, you probably, obviously, you know when you see a honeybee, um, but there is in fact two uh, technical ways to tell honeybees from all other bees. Um, really, honeybees are sort of very alien to all other bees. It's weird. No other bee has a long-term queen, for example. Um, bumblebees have a queen, but the queen will start a new colony every year. So a bumblebee queen can live three years, but every time she'll start a new colony. Um, a honeybee queen can be queen for a few years of one hive. 
So very unusual. Um, honeycomb, no other bee makes honeycomb like th those hexagons. Uh, they make, you know, stingless bees have a hive with, with wax, but it doesn't, doesn't look like that. Um, and so here's the, the sort of technical anatomy parts. Um, if you look at a drone honeybee, and I'm always excited to see one just because they're so rare to see, uh, unless you're right on top of a hive. Uh, they live very short, a very short um, length of time, obviously. Um, and um, anyway, so do you see how these, the eyes come together on top of the head? No other bees have that feature anywhere. Um, so if you see a bee, and you know it's a bee and the eyes are touching like that, it's, it's a honeybee drone. There's no other bee that, that, that has that feature. Um, on the female here, um, the one, and I only learned this recently, it's really interesting. If you look at the mandibles, this isn't a super clear photo, but um, they, there's no teeth. They're just sort of smooth in the middle. You don't see like jagged um, teeth and they're smooth and they meet in the middle like a sort of triangle with a straight line. Only honeybees have that, that feature. If you look at all native bees, you'll see actual teeth and you'll see some other close-ups where, where you can tell. So, um, oops. Another, um, so wing venation, I'll just talk about it a little bit. So this is a honeybee wing. Um, if you see, um, look at this, I, I've of course look, forgotten for the moment, the name of this particular lobe. But um, if it's really very elongated like this, it's a honeybee. And you can look at references that will show you that. But so I mentioned this because sometimes you look at Andrina bees and they can look just like a honeybee. They're brown, they're the same size, the heads are sort of heart-shaped. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at a photo, looking at them in person probably wouldn't confuse you, but if you look at an image, you're like, oh. Uh, well, if you look at the wing, this, this elongate, uh, elongated lobe is very honeybee. Uh, the other reason I put this up is, uh, so an, a reliable way to tell flies from bees, even with all the mimics, is the fact, of course, that flies have two wings. Bees have four wings, no exceptions. Um, and the reason you can't tell that easily is because when bees are in flight, and this goes for both honeybees and, and native bees, um, the bees, the hind wings attach to the front wings. And how do they attach? Um, well, you can see in this lovely photos, there's this line of hooks um, along the front edge of the hind wing. And when the bees take off, they hook on to the front wing. So it all looks like one big wing, um, even though it's not. So that's, there you go. Um, I won't talk about this for long. Actually, I only have one slide. Um, but a lot of introduced bees um, that you see around, even if there's some people split this technically between native bees and wild bees, um, because there's native bees that aren't honeybees. We kind of say native bees for everything that isn't a honeybee, but they don't really necessarily belong in this part of the country. They came from the East Coast or they were even... Um, came from Europe, like Antidium, uh, certain Antidiums. There's a lot more um, introduced bees than I realized. Um, there's some 36 that we're aware of in the US and only a handful were actually brought in for farming. The others came on fruit or um, various other ways. So uh, let's, so you're probably familiar with like, something like managed bumblebees that are kept in greenhouses. Uh, to pollinate certain certain vegetables. There's um, Osmia mason bees that are um, pollinate things like um, is it blueberries and various other um, crops. But here's a fun one. And aren't yeah? Go ahead. Aren't the Osmia that includes the blue orchard bee, which is Correct. good in orchards? Right. Yes. What, what, um, are the, what are the bees that were um, introduced, like by us? It's a really long list. So there's uh, there's managed bumblebees. Um, I don't 
I'd have to actually look up the, 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 the names of the exact species, but there's managed bumblebees, there's alkali bees. Well, alkali bees have sort of just spread a bit further than they would have that they are actually native. Um, but as Eddie mentioned, Osmia bees are a good example, the, the mason bees, because they, for example, when you, um, you can order them online and they'll send you cocoons in the mail and you put them in like a bee house on your property and then they'll, they'll hatch and they'll pollinate your whatever fruit tree you have. So um, the reason mason bees are so good at, uh, good at pollinating is, um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about wet, uh, wet carrying of pollen versus dry, dry carrying, but basically they're one of the bees that the dry carry pollen. And what that means is it's not really glued onto their body with nectar or some other substance. And so when they go from flower to flower, they lose a lot of pollen, which is great for, um, for the trees because it's a lot more pollination. When you see a honeybee, they pack the pollen tightly onto their legs and it doesn't drop off. So they still get pollen on hairs on their head and elsewhere on the body, but it's not, it's really not a feature, it's an accident. <laughs> Whereas with, um, with osmia bees and like um, leaf cutters where it's all sort of dry, sort of sprinkle on. Every time they go to another flower, they lose some. So there's different numbers people like to cite like for osmia bees, but basically some say a hundred times better than a honeybee, but it's definitely, you know, 10 to 30 times more efficient for sure, just because they're in a big hurry and they drop a lot of pollen. <laughs> um, the, the reason I put the alkali bee is because it's one of those sort of interesting ways they're managed. Um, they don't, import them or have special artificial habitats or anything. What the alfalfa farmers do um, is they leave strips of bare sort of salty ground all around the field. And these alkali bees will just move in in these huge ground nest aggregations because um, they love the, the dry salty earth and they will um, pollinate the alfalfa. They also have special adaptations to, to pollinate alfalfa. And I think I'll get back to that in a later slide. Um, okay, so apparently I've chosen this, this time to talk about helping bees. Usually you get this at ends of presentations, but uh, <laughs> why not do it sooner? Um, so when uh, people talk about helping bees, we're really talking about bringing back environment that's, um, that's good for them. So I have some quality slides, in fact. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about foraging for, for a minute. So bees, one thing you'll notice about native bees is they don't travel far from the nest. Um, so honeybees, they travel, it says 9,000 feet. I got this from uh, somewhere. Um, the Some people will say two miles. Really, they, they travel a, a, a very far for a bee. Bumblebees, 3,000 feet. Again, pretty far. They're large. They can generate their own heat. So they do, uh, they do well with long distances. They can drink a large amount of nectar, which will power them for, for, for a good distance. And then going on, um, obviously. So basically, when after honeybees, um, it's all based on size, right? Bumble, you can see. Um, Bumblebees are the biggest, and then we gradually get all the way to down to the tiny three millimeter bees. So for example, when you're gardening and you're trying to help out the bees, um, you get fl flowers are, as in forage, is emphasized a lot, slightly too much. Um, what you also need is nesting um, opportunities. So bees like, um, again, 70% of bees nest in the ground. So, um, you want to leave bare ground for them to dig holes in. That's the easiest, that's the way they like it. Um, at least little patches of it. Um, other bees are um, tunnel nesters. They're um, in, in sort of broken twigs. I'll, I'll get to nesting in a, in a minute. But um, so why do, why do honeybees uh, go this really long distance um, as opposed to all these native bees? Um, so it's, Honeybees, I'm gonna say no, obviously they don't know they're programmed by evolution, but honeybees know that if they fail, there's thousands of sisters to take their place. Um, so they're reckless 
basically. When people talk about aggressive honeybees, I don't really think about it as aggressive as much as they don't care as much if they die um, because there's a replacement. So every native bee um, other than bumblebees around here um, is, al is alone and she has to do all the work. She has to set up her own nest. She lays all the eggs, provisions them. If she dies, the entire line is gone. Um, so this means they, they instinctually um, preserve their energy and they're more cautious because again, if they overextend themselves, there's no one else uh, to do, do the job. So bees, honeybees can be reckless. Um, native bees, not so much. Uh, this is a lovely Canadian graphic because Canadians apparently live in the future where uh, pollinator habitats and windmills uh, and solar farms all go together. <laughs> um, so I, I use this because um, they actually did a lovely job and um, I'm talking about different types of um, ways to help bees with habitat. So you'll notice down here on the wind farm, it says provide access to soil. They're talking about that bare soil that ground, needs, ground bees will um, dig holes to nest in. Uh, they're talking about minimized pesticides. Pesticides, um, I didn't mention it. Somehow I skipped talking about uh, neocondinoids somehow, even though they're always the elephant in the room. Um, I'm actually not sure if I, I don't think I have a slide about neocondinoids. You hear about them a lot. Um, but basically the, the, one of the problems with them is so much of them ends up in the soil um, as opposed to even it, it just in the plants. Just a massive percentage just, um, just stays in the soil. And because so many bees um, nest in the soil, it's really bad. Um, another reason is that neocondinoids are a nerve, um, nerve gas, basically. A nerve, it's, a, not, it's not a nerve gas. It's a poison that attacks the nervous system. Um, so even a tiny amount when native bees get exposed to them either through foraging in flowers or from nesting in the, in the ground uh, and getting in contact with it, um, it damages their learning and their navigation skills. So even that slight amount of nerve damage means they go out to forage, they can't find a nest again, um, different problems like that. So it's, it's really quite insidious. Um, but anyway, um, so going back to the, the different kinds of um, habitat improvements, they're talking about minimize herbicides. That's pretty obvious. Don't mow as much. Um, again, I'll talk a bit about um, bee nesting, but a lot of leaving a lot of basically kind of broken grass, twigs, uh, deadheaded flowers, things like that is uh, what a lot of the remaining 30% of bees uh, will, will nest in. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, actually, I don't know if this bit is covered over, but when you download it, you'll, you'll see other um, items of interest. So uh, I have another similar one. So again, um, again, so 70% of bees uh, nest in the ground. They just dig holes. Um, usually it's just sort of a vertical vertical hole, it can go sideways um, with one nest. Halictus bees, for example, uh, certain halictus bees will nest in sort of aggregations. They don't, so it will be a hole that goes down and then branches out sort of like an ant, ant nest. Um, and what will happen, each bee will still fill out its own corridor and provision it and so on, but the main entrance oh, will connect them all. Uh, but anyway, so Again, um, shrubs with broken twigs. There are certain bees like um, Serotina, um, tiny carpenter bees that will really only nest in sort of dry grass that's hollow and it's been broken for them. It's already broken. So they can't really dig or cut their own nest holes or anything. There already has to be dry broken twigs and gr uh, grass stems and things like that for them to be able to nest. Um, so there's other bees that um, nest in the ground, except they want it to be uh, horizontal, right? It has to be sort of a wall so that they can make a horizontal hole in. Um, 
uh, polyester bees or cellophane bees, whichever uh, whichever you <laughs> term you prefer, uh, for example, will do that. Emil, it sounds like that's an argument for not over clearing or over cleaning your yard, like yes, leaving definitely. stand leaving dead twigs to stand for a while sure. so bees can get in there. Yes, you want dead twigs, you want like weird little rock piles, you want bare patches of dirt. Um, Sam Drogi, whom you know if you're a bee nerd, uh, he's with the, um, the Geological Survey and they have a really a great bee lab. Um, he likes to say that if your yard looks like um, so abandoned that a neighbor, neighbors come over and try to clear it up because they think you died. Um, <laughs> and that's... <laughs> You're doing it about right, right. Um, so here's another, again, when you download Emil, this. You can... is, is, there a, um, is there a specific soil that you can get alkali bees into your yard? Because I've done the insect hotels. I'm looking right. at trying to attract as much as I can. So I'll give them a mud wall. I can do that. Right. But what's the salty stuff? Where can I find something like that? That. I'd have to actually look and see what the, you know, what the pH balance is or whatever. But, you know, certain okay. bees do, um, they'll actually, they prefer to nest in like, um, you know how you have a fire corridor next to your house that's just that stamped in sand and, and crushed mm -hmm. gravel? They'll dig nests in that. Go, go figure. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, when you when you download it, you can um, read more more of these tips. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about bee corridors. Uh, this is actually in, in a part of London, but it's a it's a fun graphic. Basically, one of the um, one of the London councils decided last year. I don't know how it turned out. Obviously, we've had issues since then. Uh, but basically, they decided to plant um, pollinator friendly gardens in all twenty two of their parks, which is <laughs> Really, quite something. Um, and so, what you're doing when you when you create this these bee corridors, um, of course, often you'll hear about these uh, um, pollinator paths in relation to monarchs, right? Everybody, um, everybody likes monarchs. They migrate a really long way. So, uh, I'm, I won't really talk about that. But um, when we're talking about bees, here is a, um, a village in Ireland. <laughs> Uh, that also did a similar thing. So if you basically, if you have just a really, even a tiny uh, bee friendly habitat and it's sort of within the forage range of the native bees, obviously not the hundred foot forage range, that's probably a little too ambitious, but for even the slightly bigger ones, um, they will sort of migrate from one, one patch to the other and um, you can connect larger, larger habitats. So if you have, you know, something like here locally, Martin Luther King shoreline, um, you can connect that via city parks to, uh, you know, Mount Diablo or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, it really, um, it doesn't take a huge effort. Uh, it makes you friendly with your neighbors. It's really a fun, it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> I know that the pollinator um, posse has really focused on that in Oakland in particular, trying to create corridors. And again, yeah, we're all looking at monarchs, but that's just because they're, you know, fancy showy butterflies. Showy, yeah. But really yeah. we're trying to create these corridors for everybody and obviously not just for monarchs. So you want to get, get beyond the milkweed phase. Right. Well, speaking for the pollinator posse, we actually do a lot of talking about native bees these days when we go out to talk. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we. Uh, I, don't think I so wasn't suggesting that you only talk <laughs> about monarchs at all. That what I was saying is you guys are great at creating these pollinator rich zones and educating people about them. It's wonderful. Yeah. No, yeah, the pollinator garden at uh, at Lake Merritt is is great. I've. And also up in Salsa Creek watershed, they have one up right above Diamond Park. So they have, in fact, yes, been working on one of those pollinator corridors for years now, going through through Oakland. Um, if you're local, um, all right. So let's talk about 
um, all the very, all the things that uh, bees feed on, or at least some of them. All right, here's a fun graphic. Um, so bees have a different um, visual range than we do. They can see infrared and really they're kind of heavily weighed towards infrared. So if you're staring at some flowers and you're trying to figure out why bees are going and sometimes it's obvious there's just no pollen. The pollen has all been taken away or they, they're dried up or whatever. But sometimes you look at perfectly identical flowers and you can't really tell why bees are going from to some of them and not the others. Uh, they get infrared cues. So um, flowers have evolved over those millions of years to have uh, nectar guides. And if you look at them in infrared, um, you can see they're basically lines telling them, follow this line to the nectar, which is also happens to be in the middle where my pollen is. Uh, so get the nectar, <laughs> rub, on a, rub on the pollen, go to the next, um, next flower. Uh, speaking of nectar, so here's uh, our friend, the Hylaeus bee. And what is she doing here? Um, she's concentrating nectar. So Hylaeus bees, for example, um, which are uh, a type of polyester or cellophane bee. And I'll mention what, what that means in a minute. Um, but what she's doing is she's, she's drunk a lot of nectar from flowers. Nectar as is has a really pretty low sugar content. You don't want to haul this slightly sugary water all the way back to the nest. So what she's doing is she blows bubbles that keep evaporating in the sunlight until she has this very concentrated sugar syrup. And a number of bees do this. Um, so if you see this, that's what's happening. The bee is um, blowing the bubbles and you see her going in and out, in and out. And eventually she has... Uh, this concentrated nectar that she can go and, and use uh, to feed her larvae. What's the term for it? It's just concentrating nectar. I'm not familiar with like a more technical term. Okay. I don't think there is a more technical term, <laughs> thankfully. There's no Latin word. Uh, another one, what is this bee doing? So um, she's nibbling on a flower anther that's collecting pollen. So whenever you see a bee doing that, um, bees will, will they carry pollen on, you know, hair on their legs, hair on their abdomens, um, but they also will carry pollen back to the nest in internal crops. Uh, I didn't really have a cutaway I was happy with, but the internal crop is right about in there. And for example, the Hylaeus bee we saw a second ago she carries all her pollen and nectar in, in the internal crop. There's no hairs or anything to carry it on outside. Other bees will carry it sort of partially um, in and out. And I'll mention some later. Uh, if you see them with their head just sort of crammed in <laughs> like this, um, they're drinking nectar, right? And both, both males and females will do this. You'll see males do it more often, but even the females will get tired of, of their foraging and will have to recharge. And uh, this is what uh, one of our uh, local carpenter bees uh, is doing. And that's the male version. <laughs> he's, uh, and he's, he's drinking nectar, the recharge. Uh, nectar robbing. So what is that? So when bees get frustrated uh, about trying to navigate a complicated flower structure, or they're just not compatible to get to the nectar, uh, they will cut a hole in the base of the flower, bypass all the, all the pollen elements, and drink the nectar straight out of the tap. And that's um, called nectar robbing. You usually see male bees doing this. Um, but in fact, females do this as well. This is, a, uh, again, a, a carpenter, one of our mid-sized carpenter bee females. Uh, you can tell she's older uh, from the jagged wings. Well, she's got one jagged wing anyway, but she's also missing part of her uh, antenna. I keep trying to make sniffing sticks catch on. It hasn't happened yet, but eventually. <laughs> sniffing sticks. Okay, uh, let's talk about nests. I'm sorry? What, you, said, you said sniffing sticks? 
I did, because that's that's literally what they are, right? So their antenna are really oh, chemical gotcha, receptors. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we should we should use sniffing sticks. Not a lot of people agree with me yet. Um, so let's talk about nests. So like I said, uh, a huge majority of, of bees nest in the ground. This is a little um, sweat bee. I personally have never seen a sweat bee drink sweat. I'm sure it happens. They didn't just randomly make it up, but it just sort of seems mean to paint thousands of species of bees as sweat drinkers. <laughs> it really doesn't happen that often. But um, so bee nests, you'll see either they're uh, these holes that go straight in the ground like this. And um, if you hang out long enough, a bee will come or go. They know you're there, so they'll, they'll wait. But if you're just ridiculously patient and refuse to move like me for a bunch of minutes, they will eventually peek out. Um, or you see these uh, sort of turrets, which are pretty great. Um, this is again, another little helicted bee. Um, you can see it's sandy soil and she's built this, uh, this little fort. Um, okay, so this is um, a photo of Isra from, from Israel, but really it applies to a lot of bees um, that like to nest in stalks um, or even in, um, in sort of horizontal holes in sides of walls because the, the structure of the nest is, this, is the same. So uh, the female bee will, will have this lengthy hole and she will start um, laying eggs so you'll start provisioning and laying eggs from the back and go towards, towards the entrance, right? So um, she will put this, um, depending on the bee, th there'll be a pollen ball, which is pollen mixed in with nectar or with some bees, there's also some resin or flower oils involved. Uh, they'll build this little cache of, of, of food for, um, for the future larva and then they'll uh, lay an egg on top of it well, these are eggs. I think this one's the first, first of the five moltings that'll eventually result in an actual bee. Um, but but uh, it makes sense because it's the oldest. But basically they'll, they'll make this little pile of provisions, they'll lay an egg on it, and then they'll make a little uh, divider. So uh, this is Seratina, which is a um, small carpenter bee. That means it's basically plywood <laughs> is what she uh, divides up her nest with. So it's she'll chew up a bunch of tiny bits of essentially wood and mi mix them up with saliva and make ply tiny plywood boards basically, um, and then go towards the front. Uh, what also happens is female bees can control whether their um, eggs are male or female. So, um, so what will happen is usually little nests like this will have about 10, um, about 10 eggs in them and they'll make the first seven or so female and the next three male. And they can decide on the ratio based, based on how abundant resources are uh, and different, different um, environmental cues like that. So um, basically when they fertilize the eggs with sperm, um, they'll be female. Uh, when they don't, they're male. And the way they control this is um, in the abdomen, they have basically a separate organ containing the, uh, the eggs, the oteca. And then the, um, there's another basically separate organ containing the sperm from the male when they made it, but it's kept, kept separate and under their control. So when they need to fertilize an egg, um, they, will, they will release some sperm as the egg is passing to the canal <laughs> going out and fertilize it. And I'm sorry, did I say male or female? That will make a female. Uh, when they want a male, they'll just lay an egg without releasing any sperm. It's really very interesting. Uh, okay, some more uh, nesting action. So here's a, um, another, I don't actually see this very often. This was, I think like two years ago, but um, here's a little um, leaf cutter bee. And um, you're probably familiar, they, they, cut, they cut out these um, little shapes out of leaves take them back to the nest and then use them to, um, to line up each line, each chamber um, of the nest in these little, um, little leaf cocoons. And what she's doing here is taking, taking one of those left least, sorry, 
put those leaf pieces back to the nest. Um, what's also fun is they, they, they have a way to use, it, use their body to measure these pieces so they're always perfectly identical. identical. Um, so they'll, they'll latch onto their whole body as sort of how they measure it. Um, so the, the piece that lines the outside of the nest uh, sort of um, is sort of oval. And then the divider pieces are around and they can figure this out somehow. <laughs> Um, anyway, the the part on the right um, is a um, uh, wow! I can't believe I'm spacing uh, on the it's a Coleoxys, um cuckoo bee, and these uh, these are kleptoparasites. That's the technical term. Um, so. uh, yeah, these specifically target leaf gutters. Um, so what these cuckoo bees are? They're bees that don't build nests at all. Um, they just wait for another nest, another bee to do all the work. They move into the nest, they lay their egg on top of the other uh, bee's provisions. The larva will eventually either eat all the provisions or both the other larva and the provisions. Uh, so they're basically like cuckoo birds minus the actual interactivity. <laughs> uh, and there's different, usually these kleptoparasites um, either target one specific species or sort of a group, a small group of species that are sort of compatible. Um, so this is a, this was at that very same nest site, like just out of sight here. She was basically waiting for the other bee to do the job or leave um, so she could <laughs> go in there. Uh, and then she did eventually. I don't know how it turned out. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so this is from England, but um, we have basically near identical high laced bees here. And um, uh, this is a good illustration of what, what exactly I meant by polyester bees. So um, she is nesting in, clearly this is a, a bee hotel. Um, but the, the fun part is that what she's doing is she's basically secreting polyester. Um, she makes like a lot of col um, coletta, colettas bees and um, basically these cellophane and polyester bees, they can, they can make their own plastic. Um, so um, another fun bit of trivia about that is that um, most bees, as they, as they turn from egg all the way to pupa and then the adult bee, uh, when they turn into the pupa, they have to weave their own cocoon to turn into the adult bee. Um, polyester bees do not have to do this. The plastic shield their mother provided is, is uh, is enough. So uh, yeah, they spare them to work. They just they just have a nice plastic trench coat already uh, already built in. Emil. Yeah. I'm just going to let you know that it's a couple minutes after eleven. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not. No, go no, with... it's fine. <laughs> it's good. It's amazing. Um, uh, I'm so sorry. I do have a lot of slides. Um, I will. Um, th this will, of course, be recorded. So if you had to leave, uh, you will receive the link later. And we uh, want to get a little bit to the pictures that people posted. Too. Absolutely. Yes. I'll stick around as, as, as long as possible. But thank okay. you. Um, yes, I, I had this theory that I was going to spend less than a minute on each slide. I know. I uh, love that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hilarious theory. Yeah. I don't, like I said, I don't usually do, do these Zoom talks. So uh, obviously I'm not that smooth. Um, all right, so bumblebees um, are different than other bees. They're social bees. Um, there's a queen and a bunch of workers. That's very unusual among native bees. Um, basically, you got your you got your bumblebees. You have your stingless bees. There's probably one or two others that sort of go halfway to social. Um, but their nests, um, they're. Uh, well, this, this actually illustration is handy because you can see the sort of different um, steps in the, in the evolution of the nest. So they'll build uh, these little just little nectar pots filled with nectar to provision um, the larvae as, they, as they're growing. And then they'll, um, they'll put the eggs in and you can see um, all bee growth occurs uh, basically while they're larvae. So, whatever size they are when they get to pupa, that's, that's the final size. And, you know, I used to, I used to think that that's, that was really uniform, 
Um, it is not in bumblebees because, and we'll get to that momentarily. There's another nest. You can see those little, little honey pots that she's making. Um, okay, so the bumblebee life cycle, I should probably glance at my notes, but I'm just gonna roll with it. Um, so the, the bumblebee queen in the spring uh, will go foraging. She'll build the first couple of, um, couple of honey pots. Um, by early summer, she's, um, she's laid some eggs. And um, bee eggs actually uh, de um, develop very, very fast. Basically it's one to five days and they'll, they'll hatch. Uh, the, the, the rest of the, uh, the rest of the part to getting to the adult bee takes months, but, but the hatching is very fast. Um, anyway, so what the bumblebee queen, uh, what happens in the bumblebee nest is this first generation of workers that are very, very tiny. And I have some fun slides on that. Um, and basically the size of them depends on how much the mother fed them. So when the bumblebee queen is alone, she can really only forge so much while also building the nest. They don't really dig out their nests or anything. The nests are usually in existing holes like abandoned rodent nests or something like that. But still you gotta build all those chambers. You gotta get them the, the nectar and everything. So the first couple of um, workers will be super tiny because they didn't eat a lot. And at that point they take over um, either a big chunk of the work or most of it. Um, and then it'll go a lot quicker. And then the next, um, the next generation, there'll be a lot more workers. Um, at this point, if the nest is going really well, they can also produce another queen, uh, some males, obviously. Um, and then they'll be, they'll be mating. And then she'll go into um, hibernation until the next spring, she's got the sperm ready and all that uh, for the next generation and just go, goes and goes. Um, all right, so is the right side of the slide kind of covered up? I hope not. No, you can see it. Okay, it's good for me then. Um, you can see everything, that's good. So you can see <laughs> with my highly scientific thumb comparison, I don't actually have giant thumbs or anything. Um, if you look at your thumbnail, and you think about it, a honeybee is bigger than your thumbnail. There's, there's no honeybee that's smaller than your thumbnail, <laughs> even if you have really big thumbs. Um, she's smaller than your thumbnail. So that's a first generation worker, super tiny. Um, that's of course a queen on the, on the left. Um, this isn't like an exact ratio or anything, but really they're, they're less than half the size. Sometimes it'll be like a third of the size. It's, it's kind of crazy when you see it. Um, another one of our local bumblebees, the Melanopygus, again, the first, they, they do, the queens are also smaller than, uh, than Ossoseski queens, but even so, um, the workers, crazy tiny, much smaller than a honeybee. Um, I don't recommend thumbing at bees, <laughs> like, like I don't necessarily, but all native bees are, um, extremely unlikely to sting you. One reason is they're not defending flowers, really. If, if anything is gonna, if they're gonna defend anything, it's gonna be the nest. And bumblebees are really the only ones that bother defending their nests. Um, so unless you're like clutching a bee, a native bee, you're not gonna get stung. 30% um, of native bees don't even have stingers you can feel. They can't penetrate your skin. <laughs> so there's really basically zero danger. If you have kids and they, they wanna, uh, stare at uh, native bees. They're, they're basically perfectly safe unless they're like grabbing them or, or something. Um, hey, look at this. We're finally getting to this part. Um, so obviously, um, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make thousands of slides for all 1600 of our uh, California bees. But um, so I just try to pick some that you'll actually see um, fairly often and are also kind of similar and you can sort of um, try to tell them apart. Um, so there's a few different ways to sort of divide up these in, in sort of big chunks. Um, there are seven bee families. Uh, it's kind of redundant to really call bees main mining bees, I think, just because again, 70% of them dig <laughs> for their nests. But anyway, um, Andrenidae, mining bees, 
Apidae includes kind of the bulk of the species of the overall species of bees. Uh, you got your um, cellophane and polyester bees. This is, of course, worldwide. Uh, the sweat bees and alkali bees go together in the, in the, in the sweat bunch. Uh, the megachilidae, which means big jawed. So leaf cutters, mason bees, carter bees, resin bees, they all have big jaws. Um, Melididae, uh, they collect flora oils. I don't see those very often. Um, and I never see stenotridae because they're, um, uh, they only live in Australia and there's only a handful of them that we know of. So, um, so a somewhat more handy way to divide them is in long tongue bees and short tongue bees. And actual scientists will tell you that, um, I have a disclaimer there on the bottom, that's actually referring to evolution and not necessarily the tongue length, like visual tongue length that you're looking at, but it also does usually coincide. Um, I know that's, when you, if you go like more seriously into learning about bees, you'll, you'll start, um, start to get into those details. But um, anyway, uh, if you see a bee, for example, drinking out of a, a little trumpet shaped long flower, it's always gonna be a, tongue, a long tongue, right? Um, the, uh, the ones with actual short tongues have a bit more limited foraging range. So um, here's a, <laughs> a disclaimer illustration. Uh, technically Agapostamon bees are considered short tongue. Um, he is not a short tongue. <laughs> you can see uh, his tongue is, a, is an absolute unit and he is uh, going to drink some nectar with his very long tongue. But um, sometimes they do follow the rules. So the Habropoda, which um, you probably do see fairly often, uh, they're one of the digger bees. Um, yeah, they're always in an extreme hurry. This is, it's really hard to get a picture of them, especially in flight. Luckily I, I failed thousands of times and then I get some good ones. Um, you can see they're in such a hurry, they'll just go tongue first. Um, the plant is of course Echium, which is um, frowned upon because it's not native, but, but bees do love it. If you see Echium, you know, you're gonna get a lot of action. Um, so I mentioned earlier dry carry versus wet carry. Um, Locally in California, it's really honeybees and bumblebees that are wet carrying pollen. So if you see a bee with sort of a hard lump of, shiny hard lump of pollen, it's either a bee, um, it's either a bumblebee or a honeybee around here. Um, I say that because there's like two or three slight exceptions. Um, there's a bee in Nebraska and somewhere else that um, mixes, mixes pollen with um, flora oils and it sort of looks like hard carry. But, um, anyway, so uh, if you see this, these, these hard lumps, you'll know you're looking either at a bumblebee or a, or a honeybee. Everyone else, even if you see a, bunch, a lot of pollen um, on the leg, like on this Haverpoda bee, um, you can see that it's, it's not a shiny hard lump. It, there, she just has a lot of um, scopae, which are um, pollen carrying hairs. Um, of course, with bee sizes, right? Um, this is not actually dandelion. I always sort of, my brain def defaults to dandelion. It's, um, what is it called? Cat's ear, Eddie. Um, but it, it looks just like dandelion. So you can, you know from experience, the size of a petal, um, this little helictus bee is perching on a petal and she's still like a third of the size. Um, this is a, a Xylocopa sonorina, which is our biggest bee here in California. They're huge. They're, they could take down a hummingbird if, if they wanted to really easily. Um, of course they don't, they don't do that. Um, how can I tell it's a, it's a hylaeus, this sort of jaw, uh, this sharp bottom flat jaw line is very, very hylaeus. So if you see these sort of small green bees uh, small shiny green bees and you're trying to decide whether you're looking there's other ways but uh, if you see this sort of flat jaw like that it's definitely a hylaeus which is another helicted bee 
squash bees, unfortunately, I don't have any squash, so I don't really see those very often. Um, but the, the famous, this famous bit about squash bees is, of course, that the, the males like to congregate um, and sleep together in the blossoms. So if you have squash and you see a bunch of sort of um, longhorn bees sleeping in there together, um, they're squash bee males congregating for the night. Of course, they're not allowed back in a nest, so they, they have to sleep somewhere. <laughs> um, so I don't, I'm not going to often claim a species just because it's it's really hard. Um, but there are some some very recognizable ones that you can tell without, you know, a microscope or a genetic test even, um, with thousands and thousands of, of bees. Some some really do differentiate with, with genetic tests. Uh, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, um, one of our local bees, um, the Halictus legatus, is very recognizable from this, uh, pro this is called a pronotal tooth. And um, yeah, it's basically this sort of structure that looks like a tooth on the corner of their jaw. Um, it's the only, only bee that has this particular um, feature around here. Um, okay, I said I'd spare you the um, talking about wing, wing venation, so I'm just going to mention it <laughs> in, this, in this one case. Uh, when you look at native bees, every sort of genus and subgenus um, usually has um, at least three submarginal cells right here. Uh, these are these are submarginal cells, and um, Megachile, the big jaws, are the only ones that have two like this. So if you can't see the head at all for some reason, but you, you can clearly see the wing in your photo um, and you see two submarginal cells, um, you know it's the Megachile. Uh, the Perdita bees, so I, they like the hot desert, like this Sonora desert or the Mojave or um, Joshua tree, where actually it's too hot even for them, so they'll operate in the morning. Um, but, um, so sadly, I don't ever see them, but one, if, if you do see them, they, they do appear in the LA Arboretum for some reason. I've seen photos from there. Um, the way you can, you can tell them apart from other equally tiny bees is these sort of, their heads are very uh, wide. They have wide, wide, this sort of like, um, why, <laughs> I'm not sure how to, how to say it, but they're wider than they're tall. It's very unusual among bees, at least the ones we have around here. Um, there's obviously other better ways to tell them apart too, but if you just have a, a head you're looking at. Okay, uh, let's compare some bees. Okay, so you've got a sort of mid-sized green bee, um, which is when I think of a bee the size of a honeybee, I think mid-size. <laughs> um, and here's, a here's one of my photos of an Agapostamon female. And then on the right is an Agoclora, which is equally, um, the color balance makes it seem like the greens are more different than they are. They're pretty similar. They're shiny, they're green, there's little hair, how can you tell? Um, Agocloras have this, um, ding in the eye. This little sharp int in the eyes is how you tell them apart. So you can see there's a little bow on the inside of the eyes of the of the Agapostolan bees too, um, but there's no no like sharp indentation. Um, usually Agacloras are um, are seen more in the eastern part of the U.S., but they are they are creeping this way. Um, so you might you might see one. Here's a fun one. Um, Antiphora urbana, which is a, a frequently seen urban bee. You might recognize it. I see Elizabeth is nodding. Um, and versus Antiphora curta, which is, uh, so what's the difference? Um, one, you can see the blue eyes on the, on the urbana, which is a giveaway when comparing to other bees as well. And I'll get to that of similar size with similar stripes. Um, the curta has, blue eyes and they're tiny. They're basically a mini me version, kind of like half the size and twice as much in a hurry. Here's a fun one. I'm trying to decide whether something is a Serotina. <laughs> I see Elizabeth. Um, 
Yes, I know a lot of people have trouble with this. So whether something is a, is a seratina, which is a small um, carpenter bee, or a hylaeus, which is a, a polyester, um, polyester bee, they're known as masked bees. Um, they're both, you don't see a lot of hairs on them. They're, um, especially if you expose the photos dark, they look black, even though the seratinas are really green, but sort of really dark green. Um, but the body, the, the, they're almost, the, the sizes are very similar. Uh, the coloration is similar. So here's some differences. Uh, if you look at the top of the torso on the, uh, the little carpenter bee, there's never any markings. So basically they're everywhere behind the head, they're solid. Uh, so the, uh, there's no other markings, right? The hylaeus bees have various markings depending on the species, but there's always some uh, little yellow markings on the head and there's always, um, more notably, there's always some yellow markings on the torso. They can even be like tiny lines and dark, um, dots, but there's, there's something. Um, you can also tell the, the seratina, even though they're very small, they're still carpenter bees, so they do have uh, a bigger jaw. And they, they're, uh, their heads are more rounded, right? Even whether you're looking from above, you can see the round shape um, or, or from the side, the, uh, the hylaeus are more um, triangular, um, whether you're looking from the, the top or the side or the front. Um, the seratina do in fact partially um, carry their um, nectar and pollen in a crop and partially on their, on their legs. So they're sort of combo. <laughs> Um, here's another one. I, uh, I, I, uh, so telling last year, Glossum versus Helictus bees, they're both sweat bees. They can be look similar colored, even though the Helictus are usually, well, I, I, I chose a male for, for a reason in a second. Normally you, when you see a female, she's, she'll look a lot more like, like a last year, Um, what is the big giveaway? So if you have a reasonably sharp photo of the abdomen, on, a, on Lassio Glossum bees, you can see that the, the hair is always on the front part of the, of the turgal segments, the abdomen, the abdomen, abdomen segments. Um, the front part meaning closer, um, closest to the, the torso. Um, on a helictus bee, they're always on the back and it can be harder to tell with females uh, that are more sparse you know, might have more sparse hair or it's not just blatantly white stripes like on this male, but you'll always see the hair is on the back and on these, the hair is on the front. Pretty handy. Again, you can also tell them from the wing venation, but that's more of a pain. Um, these of course are uh, Antidium manicatum as the uh, European wool carter bee is introduced um, accidentally. They're they were brought to pollinate anything, but they're um, they're feisty little bees. Um, the males are bigger than the females, which is very unusual among bees. The males are almost always smaller than females uh, in native bees. Um, they fight for their turf, and um, we have a few native um, wool carter bees. They're really rare to see. I um, I just spotted one maybe like a week or two ago. And I was very excited. So that's uh, the European wool carter bee on the left. Um, and that's one of our native um, Antidium maculosum, which means something like spotted carter bee. And you can see he's got these perfectly even spots um, lined up on, uh, on his abdomen. And on the, uh, the European one, um, the spots are pretty even if you look from the side, but if you look from the top, there's always, the pattern can be a little bit different, but there's basically this big black area with these little blotches um, of yellow spread up around. Um, these are of course mites, which you may have, may have uh, spotted. They're not actually bad mites. Most, um, most mites on native bees are phoretic mites, meaning what they do is they, they basically get a ride on the bee, they go back to the nest and then they eat the junk that's there. So stray pollen, other random pollution. So they're sort of housekeeping <laughs> um, as opposed to of course, blood sucking mites like varroa mites. There's actually hundreds of species of mites and we definitely can't get into telling those apart. 
really I can't I can only tell if they're the not bad kind. <laughs> um, okay, so Eddie probably recognizes the photo on the right. Um, this is on the left is a queen of Bombus um, Vasasensky, which is our really our most common um, bumblebee here in California, at least in, in the lower elevations. Um, you can tell she's completely black. She has a single stripe on the, I believe, on the fourth uh, thergal segment. Um, she's got the white stripe on the front of the torso, but most importantly, she's got the white um, hair on the front of the face. If you see one of these on the right, you're extremely lucky because they're pretty rare, at least here in the in the East Bay. Um, some people are in fact now arguing that Bombus californicum is not necessarily even a separate species. Bee taxonomists argue a lot about shuffling bees around, um, but they're more rare. And you can see that um, the difference is she doesn't have white on the face. She does have this little eyebrow, um, but it's it's if you see it head on and uh, it looks completely black on the face, it's exciting. You spotted uh, a slightly more rare bee depending on where you are. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, look at some males and females. Some sexual dimorphism. I'll pick the more obvious ones, obviously. Um, the Xylocopa sonorina. Um, I forget what we were calling these not long ago, but recently they were folded back into, into the um, Xylocopa sonorina uh, carp carpenter bees, which have a pretty wide range from here into the Southwest. Um, there again, those are our biggest carpenter bees. You, you really can't mistake them when you see them flying around. They're like about the size of your thumb. Um, they're big. <laughs> uh, it's easy to tell them apart, male versus female. The, the females are orange and black. Uh, the males are what the people like to call teddy bear bees. They're gold and they have green eyes. You can't really see it very well, but the, how green their eyes are in this particular photo. Um, they're also usually a lot fuzzier. This one is a, uh, an older male. Like, how can you tell? You see the ragged wings and you can also see um, how much hair he's lost. So he's definitely a veteran. He's been around. Um, our other most common sort of mid-sized carpenter bee, they're bigger than honeybees, but they're, they're actually about the size of horse flies. That's what Tabaniformis uh, means. It's horsefly-like. So they're a size, uh, the size of a big forest fly. Uh, the females, again, solid black, just like the, the bigger ones. And the males um, have this uh, brown, brown hair or yellow brown hair on the torso, a little bit of um, on here. And they, they'll have these, I'm not gonna say they're derp derpy looking, but they are kind of derpy looking when they look at you. They have these green eyes. Um, they're, you can see them patrolling their, their turf and desperately seeking females all the time around here. Uh, speaking of desperately seeking females, um, um, there's the, the supply of females is really pretty low for the males, no matter how many, uh, how many males they, they happen to have in a season. And so when they're on, on patrol, you'll see something like a Western redbud tree, which is what this is. There'll be a ton of um, tabaniformis males patrolling it. Uh, so when one female shows up, they're really excited. In this case, all three of them try to mate simultaneously. One landed, another one landed, the other one tried to land on him. Uh, it, it didn't end well, but um, anyway, so um, back to our, our uh, European wool car carpenter bee. How can you tell them the females from the males from the females apart? Um, again, keep in mind the supplies locally. Um, the male, again, big patch of black with a little, little patches of yellow. Uh, the female sort of has this neat um, black, neat black and neat yellow stripes, very, very wasp-like. Um, and she's a lot smaller uh, than the male, which again is unusual. They can be even like half the size. Um, I did not coin the term danger butt. I like it a lot though. Um, my good Twitter friend, Lori Weidenheimer, um, who's B speaker on Twitter, came up with this. It's hilarious. Um, so what is the, the danger, danger butt? Basically, the, 
Another way to tell a male Carter B of any kind really is these spikes that they have at the end, end of the butt. <laughs> Not butt, the end of the abdomen, obviously. And it's sort of like these five, in this case, these five pointy fingers. They use them for fighting um, each other, but, and other intruders, but they also use it in mating. So um, there's a mating pair on the right and you can sort of see right here, he's basically grabbed on to the end of her abdomen with those, the danger butt spikes. And so they're, they're less dangerous right there. So um, uh, Frankie at UC Berkeley calls this the head bunker bee. Yes, they're, uh, yeah, they do like to attack. If, the, if it's other bees, they'll usually just, a bonk will be enough. If there's another male Carter bee, it's the bonk is not enough. <laughs> they will do this, which is go down to the ground and start stabbing each other. In this case, um, nobody was permanently hurt and the, the loser flew off. Okay, Hylaeus uh, bees, male, telling males from females. Um, <laughs> ideally, you'd see something like this, and then you can definitely tell which one's a male and which one's a female. But basically, the, the, your general rule is that the male will have more white markings, right? The female has um, just fewer white markings on the, on the face there. Um, our, back to our Coleoxys um, cuckoo bees. Um, it's nice and easy to tell these male from female. Um, you see a female, she has this one sort of long spike that's designed to, um, to lay eggs in other bees nests. Um, and the male has sort of multiple prongs that are mostly for hanging onto the female. They're not really, uh, they're not really a fighting bee. Um, but yeah, it's easy to tell. If you see multiple, points on the abdomen like that, um, and also kind of a shorter abdomen. Um, and then you see one big point that is a female. Um, Helictus bees, it's, again, locally, it's much easier to tell males from females. Um, males have a much longer abdomen. They're sort of thinner. Um, they have longer spindlier legs, and they also have longer, uh, longer antennae. Um, again, another one that's nice, <laughs> nice and easy to tell apart. Our most common um, agapostomans locally are, is the agapostomum texanus, even though it's, it has a much wider range in Texas, but, but I guess that's what snagged the name first. Um, the females are um, solid green, shiny. Um, and the males are solid green and shiny, but they have those black and white stripes on the abdomen. The abdomen is also longer than the females. They also have the longer antenna. And of course, if you count the segments, there's 13 segments. Um, and the legs have black and yellow markings as well. You'll see them a lot um, looking for females and foraging and whatnot in certain seasons. Um, this one is also relatively easy. Um, the, our, again, our most common bumblebee, the queen. They do look alike, obviously, you look at them. Um, the queen and female workers have just the one yellow stripe uh, there on the abdomen. If you get the right angle on the, on the males, they all have this extra tuft of yellow hairs, right? It doesn't go all the way across. It's just this yellow tuft on each side. Um, if you've observed a lot of them, you can also eventually tell them apart because of the legs are longer and spindlier in proportion and they have slightly longer antenna in proportion. But basically, if you have a clear picture of the abdomen, hopefully at least a little bit from the side, you can always tell by that extra um, tuft of yellow hair. Um, Melanopygus, it's surprising that I didn't have a better, better photo of a, of a queen, but basically she looks just like the male. Um, a little bit bigger. Again, the antenna are a little bit shorter. The legs are less spindly. If you see this situation right here, um, then you can easily tell it's a male. That's the male um, genitals. Yeah, it's kind of alarming. Um, the other thing you can you can tell um, is the wings will proportionately be bigger. Uh, 
So some bees got bigger eyes, others got male bees got bigger eyes, some got bigger antenna to, to more chemical receptors. Apparently they also got bigger wings um, for, for their job. Uh, Seratina, which is the tiny carpenter bees we've mentioned a bunch of times. Um, again, it's easiest if you see this. Um, again, um, our local males have this little inverted T on the, on the face there. If you see that, you'll know it's a male Seratina bee. Uh, the females can have a solid, um, can have no markings at all like this one or they can have this little um, sort of little white stripe right there, but it won't be a, this sort of bigger white T that gives away the males. Uh, I think I only have like two slides on these. So um, you'll, you'll probably seen these around. Um, they're male leaf cutter bees. Um, here's, I'm claiming, a, I'm actually claiming a species because it's very distinctive, the pugnacious leaf cutter bee. Um, the, uh, you can tell them from the white mittens. Yeah, that they have the front legs, um, have these white hairs on them, a little bit of these orange markings, but they, they basically look like white mittens. And I do have another, uh, thought I had another slide, maybe it's a little bit later. Um, okay, uh, Andrina bees, mining bees. Again, they can look very like honeybees, especially if you look at this one on the right, right? It's, it could be a honeybee, coloration similar and everything. Uh, what gives uh, Andrina bees away always is these vertical eyebrows. Uh, they're called facial phobia, and they're uh, they're really the only bees that have that pronounced like that. There's it's this little um, ridge that's very thick with hair. Sometimes it's harder to tell than other um, other times if you're at the wrong angle or it's in the shadow or something. But um, so I picked some that really make it stick out. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely a, a giveaway feature. Okay, a couple of weirdos, and then I think we're actually done. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's some uh, here's some fun world, uh, bees worldwide. <laughs> well, this one's another American bee. Bee that walks in water. Sadly, we don't have them around here, but it's certainly it's something I'd love to see in, in person. Um, yeah, the, there are uh, bees in Maryland that. Um, basically need water as part of provisioning their nests and they can land on, on a body of water like a, like a water strider and just sit there and inhale the water. Pretty cool. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are bees that have reverted to meat basically. Um, so there's certain, um, certain stingless bees, um, they're mostly in Brazil and Ecuador, that there's three species that have gone all the way back to meat. So that's all they'll forage on. Um, they uh, chew on the meat, they use their digestive juices to turn it into this sort of meat slurry. Um, and basically that's what they fill their, um, their, their nest provisions with and feed their larvae. And then recently again, this is a photo from, uh, by Dr. Rachel Bonoan from I think it's last year, um, and again, this is, um, I think this is Columbia. Anyway, um, they put out bait, these chicken chunks of bait and put different amounts of salt on them and see what would happen. But basically they discovered that there's another five species of um, stingless bees that will um, both forage on flowers and on meat. They're sort of halfway there. Uh, and this is a fun one I'd actually uh, never heard of until I made a slideshow. <laughs> so we, we learn all the time. Um, these bees, uh, basically it's another type of um, stingless bees, again, in South America, they actually farm uh, fungus. So wow. Their, um, their larvae need a certain um, steroid to develop. Um, that you can only get from a certain kind of fungus and they grow this fungus in the walls of their nests. I say grow, they don't do anything in particular, but when they build a new nest, they take some of the old nest with the fungus in it so that they would again grow the fungus, uh, sort of like uh, sort of like ants, basically. Yeah, like the leaf cutter ant. Right, yes, it's, it's kind of wild. 
farming bees. Uh, and that was apparently it. Um, sorry, I spilled over. So should we, um, well, first of all, are there questions? There's probably many questions. I'm sorry, I didn't stop for questions. I thought I would get through this faster, I, I swear. There are a lot of questions in the chat. I'm going to share. Do you want to read um, out some of the? And or, we also have yep. all the bees on Facebook to look at. Yes, we can do that. Right. Um, okay. Yep. We'll do both of those. I'm going to share just some of the questions that I pulled out of the chat. All right. Give me a sec. I see that you've probably answered share some of them already. Beg your pardon? I see that you've, you've probably answered some of them already. Yes. For this. Thank you. Advance portion of screen, share. Almost there, bear with me a sec. Okay, and some of you will see your names on here. So if you wanna chime in, that's fine. Can you see this okay? Yeah, I can see that. Um, all right, so, um, so the first question is, do the other bees have a central hive they return to? So there, there isn't necessarily a, a hive, but there is a one nest to return to until they're done provisioning it. Most native bees have basically one generation per year. So they'll make, um, they'll make a nest, they'll, they'll fill, fill it out. And there's, um, there's some bees that, for some reason I didn't mention a native bee lifespan, even though it's one of the more, most in, more interesting parts. Um, most bees live four to six, six, six weeks most native bees. That's of course above ground. We don't really count the, the underground part. Um, most male native bees only work, uh, work, only live and work two weeks. Uh, so really they have to get everything done very quickly, which is uh, why usually you'll get, you'll get one nest. Osmia bees live a little bit longer. They can live six to eight weeks and they work fast. Um, so uh, they'll usually um, lay one egg per day so they can have up to 30 eggs, several nests. But basically, usually, it, yes, it is one nest that they return to. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, the um, silty soils from, from creeks, they do, they do really like that. Um, you'll see native bee aggregations often next, right next to water, partially because it's, um, there's no plants in the way or other ground cover. Um, yes, so, uh, so there's, there's a question about saliva keeping the, the lining of soil nests from collapsing. So it depends on the bee. Um, resin bees obviously use resin to solidify their nests. Um, others use their own um, saliva. In the case of polyester bees, it's a plastic lining. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, they can make their uh, their nests have a plastic lining, which also keeps it um, from getting water in it, since they do like to nest near water in sort of vertical walls. Uh, White-faced bumblebees. Da, da, da. Uh, that is correct. So that is a question about bumblebees going in and out of a, a nest in a grassy front lawn. That was probably an existing hall, like I said. I, that that's a, my question. Oh, hi, Rebecca. Hi, and I think you answered it really well in subsequent yeah. slides, so you don't have to spend time answering it right now. Okay, fair enough. Um, how to tell the mites aren't the bad kind? So usually when you see mites, it's actually a little bit tricky. There's websites that have mite ident identification keys, but basically if they're the small sort of white or pink, um, and you see like a bunch of them on a native bee, it's usually the, the phoretic mites. Um, larger mites are usually kind of red and they look more like a little thick. Um, that's for example, what the varroa, varroa mite looks like. Um, those are not, as, if you can see legs, it's probably bad. Uh, observe the male megachile, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've, I've also seen, um, male megachile run up and down uh, stems. And I don't actually have the answer to that. Um, I've also been, been kind of um, 
kind of entertained and also a little bit baffled at what, what exactly are they doing? Um, okay, Eddie, is there, are those the ones basically that you didn't answer already? Um, I think that's pretty much it, unless somebody has something they want to say right now. Otherwise, we're going to go to the... Uh, yeah, let's hit the album. Okay. Do you want to share your uh, yeah, Facebook? Share yours, I guess. Okay, give me back. I okay. actually have the link posted. I can share mine also. That's fine. Okay, here we go. And I guess we'll just start with the first sure. one. Um, maybe I should have done mine because I can see them bigger, but <laughs> that's all right. Uh, okay. So that is um, Fullerton, it's California. So that is a, uh, oops. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and you can share. All right. Okay, I'll share. Uh, share. And here we go. So you've seen uh, these in the slides at this point. Um, can you see it at, at a decent size, size on your screen? Um, so that is a, an Agapostamon B. Um, she's bright green, she's about medium size, and you can see there's no none of that little agoclora ding in the, um, on the inside edge of the eye. Um, and the, the, fem, uh, the male, again, very distinctive, so this is a female. You can also tell she's a female, whoops, sorry about that, um, because you can pretty clearly see the, um, the hairs the scopa on the on the leg where she'll collect pollen. Uh, again, this one it's a little bit hard to tell the size, but actually I can tell from the later photos. So this is uh, Xylocopa sonorina, the big carpenter bee. This is a female. You saw it in the slides earlier. Uh, can that, you spell that name? Um, I can do it in the. Oh, you know what? Here. I'll write it right here. Um, okay. Yeah, so Varipuncta is what they used to be called until the, the, the little blowout. Oh, that's what you said. Yes, okay. and they've basically kind of been merged back into the bigger bigger species. Uh, this is uh, this is the male, right? The, the little golden, the big golden teddy bear. You can't see the green eye. Teddy bear. Yeah. Well, you can kind of see the green eye in this, in this photo. Pointing at with, with my finger probably isn't helpful. <laughs> Okay, uh, that is a Pantophora, and I can't quite tell the size, um, but I can see the eyes are blue, not green, so that would be an Urbana, as you saw in that comparison slide earlier. Um, the other one would be smaller and have a green, green eye. That is a wasp. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do not, I, don't really have a good grasp of the tiny wasps. So Eddie's guess is as good as mine. But how do you know it's not a bee? So uh, again, one giveaway is the antenna touching right there in the middle. You see how they both kind of come out of the same spot in the middle of the head. It's kind of a wasp giveaway. Um, bee antenna, see how they're set further apart always. Uh, that is a leaf cutter bee. I'm, it's a female. I'm not sure of the species. Um, that would be a Lassioglossum is I'm gonna go with. Um, if I could see the abdomen more clearly, I might override myself actually. It's either Helictus or Lassioglossum, um, it's a little sweat bee. If I could see the hairs again, and whether they were on the front or the back, it would be easier to tell. Um, and also, but I, the jawline actually does look kind of straight there, so it's likely halictus. I'm pulling towards halictus. That is a lasioglossum. You can see that the head is more um, round. There's no none of that straight straight line underneath. Uh, this is a halictus bee. How do I know? Um, I've looked up this bee before. Um, there isn't a blatant giveaway because it is black, right? It's a black bee. Uh, with these little white spots on the abdomen. Um, and I just know from looking looking for them before that they, it is a helictus. Uh, I forget which species, but they're sort of kind of late season helictus bees. You can see it yeah, and again. Uh, this looks more like a mantid fly. Um, <laughs> well, this one's a tricky one. Um, again, it's either a 
it's definitely a sweat bee, but I can't tell which one. It does look like a male. Those um, that those look like extra long snipping sticks. Oh, never mind. Is that the same bee, Elizabeth? Probably. No, it's not the same bee. Okay. Well, this is a um, helictus female, um, very clearly. That sort of bigger, wider abdomen than the male, and those very clear stripes um, on the back. Um, back of the ab abdominal segments. You don't have to see the jawline to, for the giveaway. Uh, let's see this. Um, it's a lassioglossum, probably a dialectus from the smaller size. There's two of these pictures of this. Yeah. Oh, yes. So yes, I'm going with, uh, it's a little dialectus female. Um, you can again see those white stripes. Um, they're pretty faint, but you can see the clear hair um, lines on the on the front of the abdominal segments. Um, this, another halictus, uh, there's the hair bands on the, on the back of the abdominal segments. Um, I can also tell from the chunkier sort of head shape, once you've observed a bunch of them, you'll get that. Um, another um, leaf cutter female, I'm not gonna claim the species, but you can see the big uh, pollen um, on the abdomen. And the abdomen's kind of you know, raised uh, so it's, in the back. So you can tell um, it's pointy, so it's a female. Even if you couldn't see the, the pollen necessarily, you could tell it's a female instead of a male. Males have a more sort of rounded, squared off um, um, abdomen. Uh, that is a serotina. Is it a serotina or a helictus? Um, I mean, hylaeus, sorry. Let's stare at it for a second. I'm going to go with hylaeus. I see the tiny little white. Uh, vertical uh, white markings, so it's going to be a um, highlighted female. Um, this is um, obviously a longhorn bee. Um, so a Melisotis, I'm not sure which one, or even if, oh, it's a male. Um, you don't, there's no pollen hair action happening here. Um, sometimes they can fool you because the females can have very long antenna on, on certain um, longhorn species, but this one's a male. You can clearly see the legs and there's no pollen carrying apparatus happening. And that's the first one again. Oh, and that is a different one. Um, is that the... Uh, The angle of the antennae is kind of hard. Yeah. Um, this um, little white plate is actually a giveaway that I can't. <laughs> um, so here's what happens when, when in doubt. Um, go to Google Images and say, um, be white front plate site bug guide dot net and in fact I'm going to say white front plate um, California it's always helpful to mention that or you'll get more results than you can deal with uh, tuk, 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 tuk. I don't see it I should know that species <laughs> I'm sorry it's not coming to me but that little um, it is a male that little front plate is distinctive and I can't come up with the species at the moment sorry Uh, okay, well, the second picture is a giveaway. That's another little uh, female leaf cutter. That is a, um, you see that question? White, not yellow. Um, yes. Hmm. So, hmm? Eddie, were you saying something? No, I'm just com uh, just hunting because it's white. It's, it's not yellow. Oh, well, part of it is probably just the exposure, but um, the other reason is, when they're first hatched, they're white or yellow, and uh, then I'm sorry, white or gray, and then they shift yellow in like 24 hours. Um, so if you see bees that look exactly like this, but are white or yellow, it means they've been hatched within the last 24 hours. Uh, I, that is a bumblebee. That makes it. 
Hmm? It's still Bomba's Boston Zelensky eye. Right. The other yes, one. Yes, correct. It's a queen from the sides, I would say. Uh, this is another bumblebee queen. You can tell it's a female because of the hard pollen. Um, so it's a queen, nice and big. I don't know the species because we don't have it around here. Um, the torso only looks weird because she's clearly an, an older veteran and the hair has just peeled off. But it's it, it should have hair on here. And if you look, um, look up keys for uh, bumblebees of Western United States, um, you can see, uh, you can find which one that is. But it's definitely, uh, definitely a, a bumblebee queen. Okay, another uh, another little leaf cutter female. Ah, okay, um, that is a from Elizabeth, and that is a uh, Carter bee. I can't see the butt, but I would say um, well, that is uh, okay. So that is. Um, what you want to call it, um, Antidium medicatum female. She just seems to, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going to call it. Um, it is an Antidium female. Uh, you can tell she's small, so she'll be smaller than the males. Um, that there's a bit too much black in there, so it might be a different species. Um, I'm a bit vexed, but it is a Carter B female. Uh, another Melisodis longhorn, probably a male. Oh, a squash bee, <laughs> as seen a uh, squash bee male probably just woke up from a from a nap. Yeah. Oh, a nice aggregation of um, of males. I, those are um, longhorn bee males, sort of. Um, yeah, they like to sleep together for protection or loneliness. Uh, this one's nice and easy. That is a um, Xylocopa tabiniformis orpifex male. So a male carpenter bee, male horsefly like carpenter bee. You saw them in the slides earlier. Another um, leaf cutter female. That is a Halictus um, female. You've seen her in the slides. So very clear, those abdomen stripes. So she's about mid size, kind of gray green, but those, um, that kind of big round abdomen with those unmistakable stripes. You said helictus female? Correct. Um, that is a, a lasioglossum female. And you can see, uh, again, those um, the stripes on the front of the abdomen. So she's kind of smaller green. Um, and she's got the stripes on the front of the, the abdomen segments. That is again the black halictus, the species name of which I don't remember. Hmm. This one's in, in Salt Lake City. So oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that. sorry. It's definitely a bumblebee, um, bumblebee queen. Nice and, nice and big, but I can't, I don't know the local uh, the local bumblebee species no there. It was so pretty. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to look at uh, look at a bumblebee. Um, online. What are we looking at here? I'm, I'm going to post the key in the chat. There's a great one from USDA. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't include a slide with like recommended books and resources. And I'm going to, I'm going to claim I did that because I wanted to hear the feedback first and see what was most useful <laughs> because I was frantically finishing my homework and changing my mind about it. Um, but when we send out the mm -hmm. recording, we'll definitely send out some recommended books and, and helpful links to everyone. Okay. I'm not sure what we're looking at here. Um, I would claim it's helictus with those stripes, but I am not sure. Oh, never mind. It is not helictus. Um, or is it? I am not sure. I'm not calling this one. Uh, ta, ta, ta. This is an Osmia bee, um, Mason bee. You can tell it's, um, well, it's probably harder to tell, but she's got the, um, the scope on the bottom of the uh, abdomen, but she's very metallic and green, so she's not a leaf cutter. 
Um, and also you, you see those big jaws of the megachile and sort of the rounded or much more rounded head than a leaf cutter. Uh, another helictus female, big chunky head, those distinctive stripes. That is a Bombus melanopygus. Um, I can't really tell if it's a queen or a worker, but it's a female Bombus melanopygus. Um, Cause yeah, the queens aren't really huge to begin with. This is of course Cianotus, which is a magnet for everything and is at least some species are, are local uh, gardening people would probably know better. What question on the Melanopygus. Yeah. There's a sub there's a subspecies which is Edwardsi. Has that been promoted to a species? I am not sure. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But there's it is in dispute. <laughs> so it's kind of people go back and forth on that. Um this, uh, this is a small, a very small osmia. And you can tell. I'm sorry. I'm going to mute somebody. Okay, sorry about that. Also, okay. I thought they might have a question, but it's probably just noise. Um, so this is a tiny osmia bee. They do come in different sizes and you can tell, again, metallic um, rounded head, but there's that, um, um, that hair or uh, um, collecting pollen on the bottom of the abdomen. It does look like it might be hair on the, on the legs, but um, it's not, it's both really. Yeah. Uh, that one's nice and easy. That is a male helictus, um, long abdomen, those helictus stripes, extra large, um, extra large antenna. Uh, that, is two um, Hylaeus bees mating and male has got extra, extra white on the um, face as seen in, uh, in the slides I was showing earlier. Uh, again, helicted, um, I'm sorry, Hylaeus. Same bee. Yeah, Hylaeus mating. Uh, that is another male helictus. Um, again, those just stripes. In this case, um, you can tell they have smaller heads than the females too. So if you get an awkward angle like this, but you see those stripes, um, the, the, the heads are more compact with, with longer antenna. Uh, that is a lasioglossum of some kind. I can't really tell which one. Um, you can, so the, the hairs on the abdomen might look a little bit confusing, but you can see they're um, thicker on the front here and here. Um, there obviously there's like sparse hairs everywhere, but the, really the distinctive stripes are there on the front. That is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that's a helictus um, female. Again, you can see those the distinctive uh, belly stripes. I'm sorry, <laughs> abdomen front stripes. Uh, I'm That's, a little bit thrown by this one. Um, this is, where is this exactly? That's the Modoc National Forest. Yeah, I'm sure that little mustache is, is very distinctive if you look it up, but I don't recognize it. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, that is a, that's a mystery. <laughs> okay, is, um, it, is it Mega Carlid? Probably, yes, but I can't really tell which one. Um, you can see sort of the, the rounded abdomen, it's small and metallic, but I'm not, I'm not sure which one. Um, another um, Hylaeus female. And another Hylaeus female. There's that famous shoulder. Uh, another Hylaeus female. That was a huge one, it was like a centimeter long. Wow. That's also from, yeah, yeah, it was big. I couldn't That's believe it. Oops, I think that was the last one, right? Let's that is the last one. All right, well, there you go. This has been uh, fun times with the ID. And <laughs> so I'm sorry it took, uh, oops, sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing. Oops, or did I? There we go.
Well, thank you for coming, everyone. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's been educating and, and helpful. Like I said, it was hard to choose what exactly to show because we do have uh, 1,600 bees. But <laughs> I tried to choose the ones that you're more like most likely to see uh, in your garden or yard, um, and that sort of look alike enough that dialing them apart might be uh, might be helpful. So I'm yeah, sure. And uh, Emil, I think also after you uh, talking, then going through people's examples, I think that for me, that just kind of solidified a lot of the things that you said. Um, that was super helpful because it's one thing to have a crystal clear picture like you were using for your examples and another thing to see what you see and then try to figure it out. Um, that was an amazing presentation. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm probably going to watch it three or four times. And then every time I have to ID a B, watch it again. Um, I, I imagine people ongoing. I mean, right now, of course, there's very few bees around. But um, about, about when do they start coming out again in the Bay Area? You know, the Bay Area is, is pretty lively for bees. So we'll, we'll basically see... Um, Bumblebee queens continue, they'll never really disappear. You'll just see a few. Um, so, but by March, we'll see like bigger activity again. Um, yeah, I was out walking around just the other day and I saw, let me see, there was three bumblebee queens mm -hmm. and there was one male megachile, sort of the, one of the pugnacious ones. Actually, that, those are the photos I used in the slides because I took them the other day. Um, he was still patrolling his, his ground, hope, hoping for the best. There weren't a lot of others though. So, <laughs> but yes, by, by March, we'll be getting lively again. The, um, you'll, you'll see Osmia really as soon as spring starts happening because they're, they're one of the earliest non-bumblebee bees that, that reappear because they can fly 10 degrees cooler than everybody else, basically. Cool. Um... That was amazing. And I, I bet we end up having some really interesting conversations on Insect Sciences uh, Museum Facebook page because of this. Um, and so if people have questions, Emil's there, he's on Twitter. I constantly harass him on both mediums to look at my stuff. <laughs> yes, and come by Insect Sciences Museum Facebook page, post your photos, ask questions. Um, yeah, and there's a few good um other good native bee um facebook groups like the native bee society group uh, that's a good group i think that's it um yeah i think that's it thanks to everybody for coming and uh stay you know if you want to keep up with what we're doing either jump onto the insect sciences museum of california facebook group where we'll keep posting more events that are upcoming I know Eddie's doing an actual bee walk tomorrow. Is that right? With Friends of Five Creeks? It's, um, we're looking for Tetranatha. It's a type of spider. UC oh, Berkeley is hosting a project called Eight-Eyed Expeditions. So we'll be meeting um, in El Cerrito, Albany to, to look for stuff. If you want to join us, please just send me something in the chat. Okay, cool. And then um, I'm hoping to organize a moth related thing uh, sometime this month, but we'll just see. Anyway, great to see you all. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming and thank you for sticking it out this, uh, this long. You were all heroic. Super fun. <laughs>